have opened your Bibles again, if you will, to Isaiah chapter 42. I want you to look at verse number 22, which is my text. Many of you have been a part of our church for a good number of years, and you know that I have preached consistently through the years a common theme on my love for America and America's Christian heritage. And it being my 32nd anniversary as pastor, I want to preach on that theme again tonight as I have many times through the years. I'm preaching tonight on this subject very simply, my heart for revival uh, in America. Isaiah said in verse number 22, but this is a people robbed and spoiled. They are all at they they are all of them snared in holes and they are hid in prison houses. They are for a prey and none delivereth for a spoil and none saith restore. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd bless the preaching of your word tonight. A hunger for the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. I pray that you would use this message in the minds and hearts of every person, Lord, from the youngest to the oldest, uh, those that are here in the auditorium this evening, and the many, many people that will watch this program uh, and see it across our state and across our nation. All the need is great, and Lord, I'm glad I serve a God that can. And so tonight, I pray that you'd bless the preaching in Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Anytime I hear a statement, read a book, or hear a sermon about revival, I wonder what that writer or what that speaker, how they define the word revival. Whether that is a revival in a person's life, a revival in a church, or even a national revival. Some would use the word revival to refer to an emotional stir. Some would use it to refer to a growth in a church, a quick or a great growth in a church. Some would use the uh, word revival or define the word revival as a spiritual awakening. A time when people would get back to a personal relationship with God. For example, a daily prayer life, which all of us need. Reading the Word of God daily, which all of us need. Faithfully attending a church, which everyone should. A newfound trust and dependency on God, which we should all have. When I think of the word revival, I think of the word restore and what it means to restore something. Isaiah said, none saith restore. He was not interested in the nation of Israel being conserved as it was because it was a nation that was robbed and a nation that was spoiled. And he said the people are for a prey. Folks just see them as an opportunity to make personal gain out of them. They are for a prey. And Isaiah said there's no one that is saying restore. He was not interested in conservation. He was interested in restoration. Now, when I think of revival in America, which has been a burden of my heart for many years and so many things I've done to work and to see revival in our state, and I think we've seen a a bit of that in our church and a bit of that in the churches that we've helped to start across the state. Brother uh, Hamlin is preaching today in Bowling Green and uh, preaching for Jared Young, and he said, I felt like I was at Clay's Mill, and he said there was such an excitement and a joy, and he said just a just a happy place and the place is filled and that that brings joy to my heart to know that we can multiply what's going on in our church and training young men for the ministry but when I think of restoration and please get the introduction I think of the men that we refer to as our founders or our founding fathers I think of their faith in God and how they expressed that faith in God in the founding documents of America. Not very many people have read, though it's a short read, the Mayflower Compact or the Declaration of Independence 
or the Constitution of the United States. And when you read those, you realize these are written by men of faith in God. Many people do not know about the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, many of them, in fact, most of them were born-again believers. They were businessmen of all kinds. Uh, they were men of respect. They were men of decency. In fact, one of the men, uh, John Witherspoon, was a pastor of a church and also a soldier, and he loved his country. For example, when you read the second paragraph of the United States Declaration of Independence, it makes this statement. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That, when, uh, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, when a government becomes destructive of these ends, what ends? That God is our creator and has created all men equal. And that God is the giver of rights. And when the government comes to the place that they are destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness." A faith in God is not something that's being pushed on America by some zealous-minded preachers, but a faith in God is what our founders knew our nation and our rights were founded upon. Faith in God is not a new concept. It is the foundational concept of the United States of America. New concepts would be things that are not found to be self-evident in nature. New concepts are those that are disruptors and corruptors of our nation's foundation. The first two paragraphs of the Declaration show how it is anchored in a solid foundation of at least three principles that are necessary for freedom anywhere in the world. First of all, all rights come from God. Second of all, the purpose of civil government is to secure those God-given rights. And third of all, the power of civil government is given by the consent of the governed. America could never have a revival or a restoration until it knows where it came from. If you were going to restore an old car, you would have to know what that car looked like when it rolled off of the assembly line onto the showroom floor. And so if we want to see a revival or a restoration of America, we're going to have to read history. And in reading history, you're going to find yourself reading the Word of God and the very principles our nation was founded upon. Take your Bibles and go with me to the book of Hosea, the Old Testament book of Hosea. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, all those little books together there. Hosea chapter 4 and verse number 6. And I'm going to preach at you for just a moment here. And so if you want to put on your asbestos jacket, you can go ahead and do that. I want to preach at you for a minute. The Bible says in Hosea chapter 4, I want you to see it. I want you to see it in verse number 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I will also forget thy children, Americans and Christians included. We have gotten so busy in our work and our families and our making money and doing the things that we enjoy doing and our hobbies that we have not learned our history. We have not learned the foundation of our nation and therefore it is being taken away and the foundations are being destroyed and absolute 
uh, 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 lies and deception are being promoted in our nation and many are believing it even in our higher institutions of learning and we're destroyed because of a lack of knowledge. I believe with all of my heart if you made Christians and you made Americans read the founding documents of America and you made them read the Bible, we would have not only a revival, we'd have a revolution. And those are similar. So many have gotten into the business of trying to make us think unnatural things are right or natural or accepted. And Hosea said it right when he said, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. In reading that great little book, God in American History, you read how the divine intervention of God's hand brought about America's greatness. Largely because the people who sought to worship the Creator God in freedom. When you first ask the question, why did they even come to America? Why weren't they satisfied to live in the old country? Why were they coming? They were coming not just to seek the freedom of religion, as some would say. They were coming to seek to serve and to worship the God of heaven and the God of this book that we hold in our hands tonight, the King James Bible. This is interesting. Thomas Jefferson's early draft of the Declaration used the word derived. Benjamin Franklin and John Adams replaced that word with the phrase endowed by their creator. Which meant that the Declaration rested upon the rights as God had given them, not as man understood them to be. America's founders chose to establish the new nation upon the natural laws of God, not upon the laws and ideas of man. Later, Congress inserted the adjective certain in the place of Jefferson's inherent, which Noah Webster in 1828 described the meaning of certain as existing in something else so as to be inseparable from it. Let me say it again. Existing in something else. Our rights existed in something else that it cannot be separated from and our rights exist because of our Creator God has given us our inalienable rights and they cannot be separated from them and to separate God from our rights is to destroy our nation. This means that once God was identified as the giver of those rights, then the word certain became appropriate because whatever God had given to mankind was, according to Webster's uh, definition, it was sure, it was true, it was undoubted, it was unquestionable, existing in fact and truth. Obviously, these and other deliberate changes in word and meaning in the Declaration of Independence had a monumental impact on the minds and hearts of every person who contributed to the Constitution. The Declaration of Independence and the United States Constitution are really not difficult to read. Now, I want to issue a challenge as I have many times. I want to challenge you to read or it may interest you that you can listen to the Declaration of Independence and you can listen to uh, the United States Constitution. Let me give you some things that will help you just to, uh, to, ju just to put it in your mind and, and uh, divide it up so you can listen or read it and understand it. There are 27 rights uh, protected in the Bill of Rights. 27. There are 27 charges made against King George III in the Declaration. There are 27 amendments to the Constitution. The Declaration has five parts. It has the preamble, which is beautifully written. It has these assertions. There are six. It asserts, first of all, that all men are created equal. Folks, that solves the, the, the racial divides. That solves it. 
God made every man equal. There's no one more valuable than another. And, and the way God proved that, God paid the same price for every soul to be redeemed as He paid the price for every man and every woman of every race, of every color, of every ethnicity. God gave His only begotten Son because God so loved the world that He gave His Son. All men are created equal. Second of all, that we're endowed by our, uh, by our Creator with certain inalienable rights. Third, that, all, all, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Fourth, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. Number five, government gets its rights from the consent of the governed. Number six, when the government begins to destroy those rights, it is the right of the people to destroy or start a new government. The third part are the charges against King George. There are three of them. The declaration has, the third part, are the charges against King George. There are 27 acts of tyranny committed by King George III against the colonists over a 15-year period. Number four, there is the defense. Two paragraphs list the actions the colonists took to peacefully resolve their differences with the king. And then number five, there's the declaration. The last paragraph is the actual declaration of independence from both the king and from his parliament. The constitution is divided into seven parts. I'm challenging you. If you haven't read it or haven't read it recently or listened to it, everybody ought to read. You, you see, you can take away something from someone if they don't know what it is or they don't know the value of it. Folks, if we read the documents and the, and the foundation of our nation, we would be fighting for our country and we would be fighting for this country to see an old-time revival or a restoration back to what's we, what we once had. For example, Article 1 is the job description of Congress, the legislative branch. Article 2 is the job description of the president, the executive branch. Article 3 is the job description of the Supreme Court, the judiciary branch. Article 4 describes the role of the states and their relationship with the federal government. Some folks think that the federal government give the, give the states the right to exist when the opposite is true. The states give the federal government the right to exist. Article 5 describes how to amend the Constitution. Article 6 declares the Constitution as the supreme law of the land and puts elected officers under oath to uphold and defend it. And Article 7 explains how the Constitution was to be ratified. It takes about 30 minutes to read the seven articles. It takes about 10 minutes to read the Bill of Rights. If you listen to them slowly, you can listen to all of them in just an hour. Now it's a shame, and shame on us when we know all the baseball players and the football players and the basketball players and all of the uh, old uh, uh, shows on television. We know all of that, but we don't know the documents on which our nation was founded. April 19, 1775 was the Battle of Lexington, not here in Kentucky. But the war for independence began. July 4th, 1776, the Declaration of Independence was adopted by Congress. November 15th, 1777, Articles of Confederation were created. March 1st, 1781, Articles of Confederation were ratified. October 19th, 1781, Cornwallis uh, surrenders at Yorktown, ending British military action and the war. September 3rd, 1783, the Treaty of Paris was signed. Remember that. September 3rd, 1783, the Treaty of Paris was signed. Great Britain recognized the colonist independence. May 25th, 1787, the Constitutional Convention opened in Philadelphia to discuss revising the Articles of Confederation. July 13, 1787, Congress passed the Northwest Ordinance. September 17, 1787, all 12 state delegations approved the Constitution and the Convention adjourned. July 21st, you can't remember all these, but if you listen to it again and you make note of these important dates, you'll recognize it is an important 
important part of history, and I'll tell a story or two about these dates in just a moment. March 4th, 1789, the first Congress under the Constitution convened in New York City. April 30th, 1789, George Washington was inaugurated as the first president of the United States. Do you know many of the fellows wanted him to be the king? By the way, yesterday was the coronation of the king, King Charles III. That was the first, that was the first since 1953. Is that right? 70 years ago. You want to watch something that is almost spiritual in behavior. Watch that, uh, watch that coronation. I keep saying inauguration. Watch that coronation. Do you know George Washington refused to be called king? You know why? Read history. He said, we already have a king. And he allowed himself to be called the president, the first of the United States. June 8, 1789, James Madison proposed a bill of rights in the House of Representatives. September 24, 1789, Congress establishes a Supreme Court. There were 13 district courts, three uh, uh, ad hoc circuit courts and the position of attorney general was established September 24th, 1789. The war with Britain cut off the supply of Bibles to the United States. On September 11th, 1777, Congress, not the Gideons, not an individual group of people that put their money together to print Bibles, but Congress instructed its Committee of Commerce to import 20,000 Bibles from Scotland, Holland, or elsewhere. January 21st, 1781, Philadelphia printer Robert Aiken petitioned Con Congress to officially sanction a publication of the Old and New Testament which he was preparing at his own expense. Congress said, and I quote, We highly approve the pious and laudable undertaking of Mr. Aiken as subservient to the interest of religion in this country, and they recommend this edition of the Bible to be uh, Bible to the inhabitants of the United States. Congress made sure that Bibles were available in America. Now some would make you think today that faith in God or religion is something that is being forced on America by a few religious zealots. That's not true. America was founded on a faith in God. I said America was founded on a faith in God. America was founded on a faith in God. That's not, that's not a statement of emotion that's proven by the founding documents and the many artifacts of American history. The Supreme Court of the United States declared after reviewing the writings and founding documents of America as late as 1892, I quote, this is a Christian nation. Regardless of what Barack Obama said, when he declared this is no longer a Christian nation, I have news for him, America was founded on the principles of the Word of God. It was founded as a Christian nation, and I, for one, would like to see an old-time restoration and revival, a returning to those documents and that faith in God that brought those about. John Quincy Adams stated the highest glory of the American Revolution was this. It connected in one indissoluble bond the principles of civil government with the principles of Christianity. From the day of declaration, the American people were bound by the laws of God, which they all, and by the laws of the gospel, which they nearly all acknowledge as the rules of their conduct. Patrick Henry said, don't miss this quote, it is when people forget God that tyrants forge their chains. How sad our states across the nation, including Kentucky, had to pass legislation to protect children from some of, what, uh, from some of the teachers and what they wanted to 
teach them to sexualize the children. What a sad day in America. And then that same crowd will fight and say, God has no business in these halls. I've got news for you. America was founded on the principles of the word of God. Read of the colonial period of America, 1606 to the time of, of the declaration, and you'll find that these colonies were founded by those who worked to spread the gospel of the Lord Jesus. And you read the history and where the 56 signers of the declaration came from. They came from those colonies that were working. A church was built first and the school was in the church and the Bible was the first textbook. And that was the center of those towns as they worked to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. One of the most outstanding chaplains, don't miss this story, of Washington's army in the revolution was the, Rev was the Reverend John Gano. John Gano was the pastor of the First Baptist Church in New York City. After the war started, Pastor John Gano joined the American forces. It is said that many members of his church volunteered for service when Gano left for the army. Gano served with distinction as army chaplain during the greater part of the war. He was described as a modest, brave, and kind man. He is reported to have been under fire in battle many times, specifically stated on Chatterton's Hill where 4,000 British moved against 1,400 patriots. The fight was comparatively short and sharp. The part of the, a part of the, of the brigade became panic-stricken, and some of the men started to run, throwing down their arms. Chaplain Gano left his position as chaplain. He made his way quickly to the front lines, encouraging the men and ministering to the wounded. It is said that John Gano and General George Washington were not only pers close, uh, uh, pers uh, personal and close friends. It is documented that John Gano baptized the great American general, George Washington, in Valley Forge. In Valley Forge. April 19, 1783, the peace treaty with England was announced. There was a great celebration George Washington asked John Cano to give the prayer of thanksgiving with the signing of the peace treaty. After the war, Cano returned, 1784, to his pastorate in New York City. He had been gone for eight years, and what once was a church of 200 members, only 37 people remained. The British had taken his church and had turned it into a stable for horses. He was faced with many difficult challenges, but he continued his work until he died August 10, 1804. Here's an interesting tidbit for us. John Gano died in the state of Kentucky. He is buried in the section called the Daughters of the Revolutionary War section of the Frankfort, Kentucky Cemetery the cemetery that overlooks our state capitol, this is the same section where Daniel Boone is buried. John Gano. If you read the history of Transylvania University, you would find that the history of this university, as many others, Dartmouth, Yale, Princeton, Harvard, Duke University, and I hate to say that out loud in Kentucky, they were once Christian anyway. I'm going to preach the truth whether you, you, whether you Duke fans like it or not, you know I am. <laughs> Transylvania University started as Transylvania Seminary. It was 1787 before Kentucky became a state. It was in the area that is Danville now, 12,000 acres was given. David Rice was one of the first teachers and professors at Transylvania. 
I have a copy of his textbook that he used in class. It was a King James Bible. David Rice taught this Bible as he trained seminary students. Kentucky became a state in 1792. Just after that, they came to Gratz Park here in Lexington, and that's where Transylvania, once Transylvania Seminary, then Transylvania College, Transylvania University, that's their history. You may know the story. I was invited there some 15 years ago to speak to a Bible study group. And when I got to there, when I got there, there was a huge protest of my coming. They said, this is a right wing, uh, what, what, what they called me, a right wing something nut. Maybe I shouldn't remember it. <laughs> because some of the words they said in that protest of my coming, it was not very nice. You can ask the deacons after church what they said. When I went in, they, they were protesting my coming, and I said, and, and, and finally they calmed down. The building was full. I said, now, I, I, I want to share, before I speak I, 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 or give the speech that I had prepared for tonight, I want to share something with you that I'm sure you know, but I just want to make sure we're on the same ground here. Of course, you know Transylvania University began as Transylvania Seminary. And you know they began training preachers like I am. You already know that. The tuition you pay, surely you know the history of your school. And I told them I have a copy of your first textbook that was used in Transylvania. And it is nearly 400 years old. That got their attention. And then I held up the King James Bible. How sad it is that our people are robbed and spoiled. Hosea said they're destroyed for a lack of knowledge. You say, preacher, what about separation of church and state? That phrase came from a letter written by Thomas Jefferson to the Danbury Baptist, Danbury, Connecticut. It had nothing to do with establishing a wall to prevent the expression of faith and religion, but it had everything to do to promise their right of preaching the gospel. You see, the Danbury Baptists were being affected by the state church, and they were being controlled. And they wrote a letter to Thomas Jefferson. I have it. I won't read it tonight for sake of time. I'm out of time now. But he closed his letter by saying... <clears throat> Those sentiments which tend to restore to man all his natural rights, convinced he has no natural right in opposition to his social duties. I reciprocate your kind prayers for the protection and blessing of the common father and creator of man and tender you for yourselves and your religious association assurances of my high respect and esteem. Thomas Jefferson did not create a wall of separation to keep the church or to keep the truth of the Bible from the minds and the hearts of Americans. He said there is a wall of separation that keeps the state from telling the church what to do and the responsibility of the church is going to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We cannot be restored until we know what we look like originally. We cannot have revival unless we know what we're supposed to be like. And so I say tonight, these things. Let's get back to reading the Word of God. Let's get back to reading our founding documents. I wish I had time to just sit down with you and go through the parallel concepts between the United States Constitution and the Bible and where all of the phrases came from in the Bible, such as in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, promote the general welfare, provide for the common defense, all of that coming from Scripture. Spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the job of the church. Now I want to say that's not the responsibility of government. They wield a sword of judgment. We wield the sword of the word of God. It's not the government's job. And you've heard me say it many times. Uh, the, the, the problem with our nation is a lack of the church working to win people to Christ. And so I'll say this and I'll finish. We must spread the gospel of Christ. What is it? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's a penalty for sin. For the wages of sin is death. 
Jesus paid our penalty for us. God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then we must give the gospel that we must accept him by faith as our personal Savior. That's the work of the church. That's the work of the missionary. That's the work of the evangelist. That's the work of the local church. And so once again tonight, as I close 32 years as a pastor, I call again our attention and our attendance to the fact we can't have a restoration until we know where we came from. And we're going to have to read and study to find out where we came from. When we do, we can then see a revival in our country. Stand with me if you will.